Hello, everyone. So welcome to our first class. Um, so we got lecture one. Uh, we're going to talk about taxonomy, natural selection, levels of classification. So uh, we'll get into some very brief general introductions of some topics. Um, and then there will be some topics that will be more in depth. Okay, so make sure you have your notes out, uh, maybe on Word, maybe on your notebook. Um, so be ready be ready to take some notes, write down the most important topics. Remember, all the content on the test is based off these videos. So make sure you have the info from the videos. Okay, nothing else. So, um, so in biology, we classify, we split into three sections, the three domains of life. We got bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, eukarya, eukaryotes, so mainly everything that's living. Um, and then uh, we had a, back then they had an old six king, kingdom system. So remember we have bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, but it used to be split into eukarya, into protists, plantae, fungi, and animalia. Um, but now we have that um, system in which, you probably remember from elementary school, or dear King Philip came over, I remember that little phrase, uh, where we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So that's kind of how we're, we're narrowing it down depending on different characteristics. So for example, um, it's called the Linnaean classification system. So for example, domain, you have eukaryota. That would include all organisms with cells with a nucleus and a membrane. Okay, and then you go down a little bit more and then you go to, through the kingdom, animalia. So then not only do they all have cells with the nucleus and the membrane, but that includes organisms that, are, that can move on their own. And then you go down to chordate, that includes organisms with a notochord. So you're, you're kind of, um, you're kind of uh, going down this this little um, bottle and just removing everything that's not uh, uh, that doesn't have those specific characteristics that you want on a phylum or a class or an order. So you're kind of narrowing it down to one specific species. So at the end, uh, this example gives us the Homo sapiens species. Okay, sapiens species genus Homo, um, bipedal Homo sapiens. Okay, so so it's just a little brief intro. Um, so you can remember those different classifications and why we go down. Now here's another example. Uh, if we look at the example of Canis lupus, canine, uh, we start at the top with animalia, and then the ones that have same thing, the ones with notochords, so others get eliminated, like shellfish, uh, jellyfish, things like that. Then you got mammals, so others get eliminated, like alligators. So then you start trimming it down specifically to a species. Okay. Now. Um, that transitions over uh, to microevolution. So we don't want to know, um, we're not going to get into detail specifically on naming those species. We want to know more about their interactions and things that affect them um, in general. Okay, so we have, we're going to talk a little bit about microevolution, so the change in allele frequencies uh, within a population over time. Okay, so changing of those frequencies, changing of those uh, specific traits, specific characteristics. Okay, so that would be our microevolution. So we're changing those little allele frequencies through time. Okay, so there's different ways this change can occur. So it can go through selection, which can be natural or artificial. It can go through mutations. Um, it can go through gene flow, and it can go through genetic drift. So those are the four main ones, and we're going to break down each one a little bit more. Um, but uh, this is how we change these frequencies. So that's why we have this variety of, of all these characteristics or all these different species and animals with so many different things um, in, the, in, their, in their body, in their DNA, in their, in their allele frequencies, okay? So um, natural selection, uh, remember we got Charles Darwin. Let me move my little, my little, uh -huh. there it is, my little camera, okay? So Charles Darwin said, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So who survives? The ones that are able to adapt. Think about right now in COVID, think about everything else. Those that are able to adapt are able to survive. I teach uh, students in high school as well. And I mean, you see a complete difference of those that were able to um, adapt at home and do their work. They are able to pass the classes, but those that really can't change their routine or the way they work or their mindset, then they're really not going to be able to survive high school, <laughs> you can say. Remember high school back in the day? But um, but that's basically uh, natural selection. So the most responsive to change are the ones that are going to survive, okay? Um, so Darwin had a couple of observations. So he said, so he saw that offspring resemble their parents. Um, he saw that there were variation among individuals 
within the specific populations. Um, and then I move this back up again. I think that's better over there. And then he also noticed that most populations produce more individuals that can survive. So obviously, um, the more people that are adapt to surviving in that area are the ones that have bigger populations. Okay, so those are three of his main observations. So offsprings are similar to parents. There's variation between the individuals. We're not all twins. We're not all the same. Um, and most populations produce more individuals that can survive. Okay. Um, those in, he also said that those individuals with traits that uh, are able to make them better suited to their environment will survive and reproduce more. So therefore, they will pass those traits on to their offspring. It's common sense, right? Um, if they're able to survive, they're the ones that are going to have offspring. So those traits that were used to survive will be passed on to their offspring. So over time, more individuals in that population, population will have those good traits that were passed on from the first one that survived, right? Um, so that's why you see certain regions or areas, um, uh, more in ecology classes, but uh, you can see certain areas where they have specific species or certain animals that are able to survive in that area because of characteristics that they have. And there's a lot of examples, um, okay? Um, this differential reproductive um, it's called natural selection, okay? So this is natural selection, and it is not random. So I'm sure you know that. Natural selection is not random. It's specifically targeting individuals with specific traits that are not or are able to survive. Okay, so natural selection is not random, right? <clears throat> also, the environment is constantly changing. So any traits that can give a, a species an advantage at one point uh, might be a disadvantage and another point. Um, and again, I, there's a couple of videos that I'm going to send you the links to so you can watch. But um, there's some traits that are able to, be, that are used and are seen as an advantage at a certain amount of time, but then the environment changes and then they have to adapt so those traits are no longer suitable anymore. Okay. Um, so you have natural selection in the rock pocket mouse. So it's a little mice. Um, so I'm going to post this link on, on Canvas. Uh, probably right under the, the video as well, so you can watch this. Um, it's like a sub-video. Make sure you watch it because there may be some questions on the test on the video. Um, then there's also lact lactose tolerance in humans. It's also another video on how um, how humans are able or unable to <laughs> break down lactase or the enzyme, okay? So um, I'm going to post these two videos on, on, on Canvas. Uh, peppered moths is an example. So in, in, in the winter or in the summer when... when um, when these uh, factories um, started. So it was a certain area where these factories started producing all this, this smoke pollution, um, all this uh, debris, and it was all black. So then before, when the trees were white, when the area was white, uh, the white moths were able to survive. You can easily identify these black moths, and they were eaten by other predators, right? Um, but now, when, when that occurred, and there was this change in the environment, uh, the black ones were the ones that are able to camouflage or survive in that new environment, and the white ones were the ones that were selected against. Okay, so it is not random. They're specifically targeting individuals that couldn't hide themselves uh, in that environment. Okay, so this is a, an example of that change of environment and the change of of um, of advantageous traits at a certain amount of time. Okay, um, now artificial selection. That one's not random. Artificial selection. Um, it's also not random. We artificially select what we want. You see this a lot in GMOs and crops where we pick the best fruits, the best traits to create a fruit or vegetable, and those are the plants that we're going to keep growing, and we're going to specifically choose those traits. So that's artificial selection. We are making um, the best uh, possible corn, the best possible vegetables, uh, because that's the one we want. That's the one we really want. That's the one that's going to be sold and that's one of the ones that people are going to buy because it looks nice, it looks good, it's going to last longer, so we specifically target those uh, uh, those traits. Okay, um, So you see it in dogs as well, we start breeding, so most of these variations um, are created through artificial selection. Oh, so we should probably breed this and this, or this one and this one, create a Pomeranian and a Husky and create a Pomsky. So like that's artificially creating specific breeds of dogs. Okay. Um, so that's artificial selection. It's not random. It's specifically targeting a, a characteristic or a trait. All right. Um, sexual selection is another one. It's also not random. 
Um, this is a bird actually trying to, to, to impress the female. So that's a male trying to impress the female. Show off to you like, hey, if you want to come kick it up near the tree, near some leaves, when I get some offspring so they can survive, so we can back up Darwin's theory. Um, they don't really talk like that, but uh, sexual selection is not random. A mate will choose another mate if it is attracted to that mate. Um, so it's specifically targeting or choosing that mate. So that's sexual selection. Okay. There's also a, a cool video on that that I'm going to post as well. So make sure you watch those three videos, okay? Um, that there may be some questions on the test. Right? Now, then we have genetic drift. So these are random fluctuations in the frequencies of those alleles from generation to generation uh, due to like random chance events. Okay, so um, as you can see in this example, you have um, little green beetles and brown beetles. Person was walking by and decided to step on the green beetle beetles. He didn't step on them green because they were actually green. And he's like, I'm going to kill green beetles today. That was random. He just stepped on them. And then it changed the uh, Leo frequencies of that population. Think about it. Now you have less green beetles. So obviously the brown ones are going to reproduce more, right? Um, so that's a genetic drift. That's this random change on that population, okay? Um, there's two types of genetic drift. So there's what's called the founder effect. And there's what's called the bottleneck effect. Um, so if you think about, on top, if you think about the original population, you have this on the left, the founder effect, the circle of just original uh, population of organisms, and then some events occurred, random events, and there was a new population of those originals that were saved, that, that were kept. Uh, the bottleneck is kind of similar, but um, only certain, certain individuals were able to survive and kind of move through. It doesn't necessarily have to be the original ones. Um, again, we have some notes here. So both are random. Um, the founder effect and the bottleneck effect result in a smaller population with a subset of genetic diversity, so more diversity of the original population. So you're just you're getting like a little area of that original population. Uh, the bottleneck um, is where most of the originals wiped out, leaving only a couple uh, that are left over. So most of the originals. The founder is where the parent or the main ones kind of are left intact. And then there's two populations of that species that can evolve separately and create different ones, different species, okay? Or recombine again to make a single population. Feel free to pause, pause these videos to take notes and all the time. So I think that's a good part about doing these kind of videos that you can just pause them whenever you want, whenever you miss something and then, um, and then continue. Um, now, we have what's called gene flow. So the words themselves, a lot of this in science, the words themselves are going to tell you, are going to give you a hint of what it's about, but it's literally the flow of these genes. Uh, so you have population one on the left and population two on the right, one in red, one in blue. Um, there's this barrier in between, but then all of a sudden they start flowing between each, each other populations. So the genes will start mixing up and the animals will move to one area or another. Um, so that's basically gene flow, the flow of the genes well, between populations. Okay, um, it is a movement of the populations from one to another. Um, it is considered random, but can be debated. So animals can just pretty much move across and, and go to another place uh, randomly just because. Or they can say, I don't know, maybe there's better food over there. Or maybe um, there's better shelter over there. Or maybe the, the, the environment is a little different over there. So they'll move maybe with a purpose, but it is considered random. Okay, So for example, a bee carrying pollen from one flower to another um, that can carry the genes, the gene flows, a uh, caribou from one herd mating with members of another herd. So it's just mixing those genes between populations. So that's basically gene flow, right? Okay, um, then we have what's called mutations. So this is a big one, all right? And this is rem and this is relatable uh, more with COVID. So we'll probably get into that until like the last week of school. But mutations are random changes in the DNA, okay? Um, they can be neutral, they can be beneficial, or they can be detrimental. What does that mean? That means there can be a change in a mutation that it doesn't affect the survival of that species or that organism. It's just a change that happened. There's some changes that can be beneficial that help them help that organism survive, or there's some that can be detrimental that do not help it survive. So it can be either way. It can be good, it can be bad, or it can just be a random neutral change that just happened. Okay. Um, so these are the ways we get new alleles, that we get all these new different species and these um, 
new strands of different things. There's mutations that occur along the way through offspring that can create um, new alleles or new or new um, organisms or new species. Okay, so we have an example here of uh, sickle cell anemia, which you've probably heard of before. Um, so it's like a point mutation, so just a mutation of a specific base in the DNA. Um, so when you go from DNA to RNA to protein, so to create a protein, since we change a letter, the protein itself changes. The fact that that protein changed changes completely the shape of the red blood cell. So now, um, based on that small mutation of that letter mutation, you don't have normal red blood cells. You have sickles, sickled red blood cells. So it's a different shape, uh, more prone to coagulation. Um, they can block the arteries. So it's it's a it, it's a lot of problems that that occur with people that have sickle cell anemia. Okay, so it's based off a small mutation in the DNA. Well, not so small, right? Uh, huge changes in life, but um, so that's one example of a mutation. Okay. Then we have speciation. Um, so that is if two interbreeding organisms can't mate and reproduce anymore, then they become two different species. Okay. So that's basically speciation. It's just kind of split into two species now, um, so they can maybe mate and reproduce with other um, other organisms or other individuals. Okay. So that's speciation, split into two different species. Okay. Now, um, you can take a little break if you like. We're going to get into the second part of the video, and this is on levels of classification, and it shouldn't be that long either. Um, it should be pretty short. Okay, so um, feel free to pause it if you like. If not, let's keep going. All right. So uh, we're talking about biology. Bio means life. Uh, obviously, uh, logos or ology, the study of life. Um, so we're going to talk about what is considered living or a living organism, okay? What is alive? Why are we talking about things that are alive? What makes them alive, okay? What makes something living, okay? So there are characteristics of life that make specific beings uh, be considered living, okay? So here are seven. Uh, they're composed of cells. They can reproduce. They can grow and develop. They obtain and use energy. So that's metabolism. They can respond to the environment. That's homeostasis. Uh, they have DNA as their main genetic code, and they can evolve and adapt. So we're going to get into a little bit of just one slide of each one, a little bit into more info on each one. But those are the main characteristics of life that we considered an organism uh, to be living if it, if it follows these characteristics. Okay, So uh, living organisms are composed of cells that came from other cells. Okay, So we have unicellular and multicellular. So unicellular are organisms made of just one cell. And then multicellular, we have organisms made of many cells with diversity, um, and we have so many different types of cells in the body, 85, over 85 types of cells in the human body. body. So, um, so even if they have one cell or many cells, they're still considered living. So that's the, fir main, the first characteristic. Um, they're composed of cells. That's the first one. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a unicellular and multicellular. Look at that beautiful froggy frog. Now, number two is living organisms can reproduce, okay? Uh, so we have asexual reproduction or we have sexual reproduction. Asexual, so just a single individual copies DNA, divides into two, from one to two, two to four, four to eight, and just keeps going, producing identical offspring. Uh, when we have sexual reproduction, then a male and a female, gametes join, form a zygote, uh, and then we have genetically different offspring, okay? Some may be similar, but... Uh, pretty much genetically different offspring, and that's sexual reproduction. So they must be able to reproduce. Okay. Um, so your examples is binary fission on an amoeba. So there's one, kind of split into two. Those two will split into four. So these two are exactly the same. And then those, their two will be exactly the same, and it just keeps splitting, right? Asexual. Uh, sexual, you have this, um, this tadpole right here, this froggy here. Mating eggs and sperm, made a zygote, create a little tadpole, adult nearly complete, and here's an adult. So, uh, so that's a little life cycle, right, uh, through sexual reproduction, which we'll probably get into detail later on in other videos. Number three, living organisms must grow and develop, okay? So they can't just stay the same. They must grow and develop. Even single-celled organisms uh, grow in small sizes, um, but they must grow and develop. Okay, so single cell organisms growth is a sample increase in size. Multicellular is more extensive development of that zygote to a mature um, offspring. Okay, 
Um, so organisms must grow and develop. That's number three. Number four, organisms must obtain and use energy. Okay, so all living things obtain energy from the sun. Um, so we got here photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So we got both the cycle. Remember, photos and plants use energy from the sun um, to create uh, glucose, to create uh, and use oxygen as a byproduct. We use that glucose to get energy to make ATP and that oxygen to breathe and release CO2 and water in the plant. So it's a little cycle again. Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So living organisms must obtain and use energy. Okay, uh, Metabolism means the sum of all of those chemical reactions in a living organism. So all these mixtures of chemical reactions, getting ATP, making ATP, um, using ATP, burning of fat, all these things that occur throughout our body, that would be our metabolism, the sum of all those chemical reactions in a living organism. So number four, living organisms obtain and use energy. Number five, living organisms respond to stimuli. Let me get some water. I'm a little thirsty. So, living organisms are able to detect and respond to a stimulus, right? So, it can be internal stimuli. At blood glucose levels, you're able to tell, I'm feeling lightheaded, uh, my sugar is dropping, um, things like that. So, that's internal stimuli. And then there's also external stimuli, like night touch, heat, um, side, so things from the outside. So living organisms must respond to stimuli, all right, to be considered uh, living in one of those characteristics. Um, they have, living organisms have mechanisms that maintain internal homeostasis. So homeostasis just means a balance, all right, the same state. So all living organisms must have a balance somehow in different areas. And think about it, um, that's true, we need a certain amount of glucose levels uh, we need a certain amount of blood pressure. We need a, a certain heart rate, uh, all kinds of hormones in our body that need to be at a certain amount. So we need to have a stable uh, environment or homeostasis, right? pH level, um, things like that, temperature for sure. So uh, we need to keep at a constant level. So living organisms are able to maintain a homeostasis. Oh, we've got, we've got beautiful mice. Mouse. Living organisms are also considered living if they have DNA as their genetic code, all right? So we talk all about DNA, and DNA we get everything. We get um, from our basis, we get all the proteins that we make, all the cells, so DNA has to be the genetic code, okay? And the last one, uh, populations of those living organisms must evolve and adapt, okay? So they're able to evolve and adapt. So evolution happens at the population level so the population is able to evolve as a population and then adapt to changes. So uh, adaptations are changes in that gene pool that make some of those individuals better suited for that environment to survive and reproduce, passing on adaptive traits. So a population that's living um, is able to uh, evolve and adapt. Okay. okay. So those are our eight. And um, feel free to take another little break if you like. Uh, we're almost done, last one. And uh, this would be kind of levels of organization. So we just, it's, um, it's just uh, going from very small to very big, just kind of our little levels of, of organizing, right? Um, so we start at the smallest levels. We got these little subatomic particles, proton, neutrons, and electrons, uh, which we'll probably get into the next, next couple of videos. Um, so here's our atom. Uh, protons, electrons, or neutrons. So number one is our subatomic particles. Uh, you don't need to go in depth into these. Uh, you just need to know the the, the, the main ones, okay? But we're not going to get in, too into detail. We'll probably in, later in the videos, we'll use some of these um, for kind of to get a better idea, right? So then we have subatomic particles in here. So the protons, neutrons, electrons. Then we have the atoms. So the smallest um, that retains all the chemical properties of that element. Um, right, so so an atom of gold, okay, anything smaller, anything less would be the subatomic particles, like the neutrons, electrons, and protons, right? Then we have molecules, so two or more atoms um, that are chemically bonded together, okay, so that's when we get molecules. So we have 
These subatomic particles put together make an atom. Different atoms make a molecule. Different molecules can create uh, cell organelles or little organs in the cells. Okay, so they're specialized uh, within that cell that perform specific functions. Okay, so let me move this down a little bit. Okay, specialized structures within the cell that perform specific functions. So that would be our cell organelles. Then after that, uh, we have cells. So out of those organelles, we make a cell. Uh, we have eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells um, as well. Oh, that's a bell. That's cool. Eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And then those cells will bond to create some tissues. So those are groups of cells that work together for a specific function. Okay. Those are tissues, groups of cells that work together for a specific function. Maybe into anatomy and physiology, maybe you'll get it more in detail. Then we have organs. So those are groups of tissues that work together to perform specific functions. Okay. So you're able to differentiate between organs depending on the tissues, the tissue samples that you get. Right? Then those organs, combine those organs to create an organ system. All right. So a group of organs that work together to perform closely related functions. You see that trend that we're going? We're kind of building up between those. Um, then you get a combination of these organ systems to create an organism, right? An entire living entity composed of cells. Okay. Um, so we, we split them into species. So those are organisms that can breed and produce fertile offspring. Um, that way they're the, the same species. Okay. And then you get organisms, put them together. And create a population, a group of those individuals of that same species that live in the same area. Okay, uh, so this is where evolution will begin to occur at a population. Okay, not at an organism, but at a population. So a group of those individuals that live in the same species, in the same area, that are part of the same species that live in the same area. And then a pop, different populations can create a community uh, overall of organisms that live together in a certain area. So you can have populations of zebras and giraffes and, and other, uh, other species of organisms that will create a community. So organ, organ system, organism, population, community. And then we have our ecosystem. Um, this would be the all living organisms in a specific area, even with the non-living. Remember, um, biology is a study of life. So living organisms have those characteristics that we talked about. A biotic is living, but abiotic is non-living, all right? So organisms um, live in that area, in that ecosystem, but you also have the weather. You have the rocks, you have the dirt, you have the rain, the moisture, radiation, fire. So things that aren't necessarily alive, that make up an ecosystem. So when we talk about ecosystem, we talk about everything that's living and things that are not living as well. That's a big ecosystem, okay? And the last one. Uh, is our biosphere. So all the ecosystems putting together, the biomes, everything like that, um, into one planet, planet Earth. Uh, yep, I believe that was the last one. So um, that's it for the notes. It was just a little general intro on many of the topics. And uh, so the test will be information from these. Uh, I'll post the other video later today as well. Um, so make sure you have notes and um, and, and save up all your notes so when it comes to tests next time I'll help you out with a study review or things like that a test review so you can, a study guide so you can so you can help you out with the test right and um, I'll see you in the next video